Well, this week we're going to continue in what we would call uh, our flyover series of the book of Exodus. And so we call this a flyover because um, rather than being like a, uh, a verse by verse, chapter by chapter, going through the book of Exodus, we're actually kind of doing it like big sections at a time. And so what we've done is kind of put this challenge out there is to uh, read uh, the book of Exodus as we preach through it. So the first week was 1 through 5. This week is 6 through um, 10. And then uh, next week, a- as you read, it would be 11 through 15. And so each week we will pick a passage, uh, something in there that helps us really kind of understand like the, the, the bigger narrative of the book of Exodus. Of course, as we're looking at the book of Exodus, we really want to understand how the book of Exodus fits into the whole of the Bible. You know, um, if the book of Genesis, the very first book of the Bible, could be uh, about the story of God's creation, the book of Exodus would simply be about the God's creation of a nation, God making a nation. And uh, we see here uh, that nation would be Israel, the Israelites. Exodus is simply um, a book that is centered on God. Um, It's a God-centered message that teaches us to live a God-centered life. Very simply simply put. Um, The world teaches us to run from our problems. That's what the world teaches us to do. We have problems um, when, when things happen to us that are uncomfortable... When we have, I don't know if you want to say drama in our lives or hurt or pain in our lives, a lot of times we run from it. We run from it and we always run to something else. We'll find some other way to fill that void. However, the Bible teaches us something different. The Bible teaches us to run to it, to run to God, not to run from problems, but rather to run to the one who can help us in our problems. And um, as we have our problems and we have difficulties in life that God is the one um, who can help us. So we like just want to do like a little bit of of, of background to get us up to this point where we're going to be this morning and just to really cover kind of the four main characters so far, our four, four, four main groups here in the book of Exodus. And so the first would be the Israelites. Um, these are God's people. Uh, in the book of Genesis, we see that God made a promise to Abraham and and then he fulfilled that promise through his sons, Isaac, and then Jacob. Um, and then of Jacob's sons, uh, Joseph was, was sold into slavery and sent to Egypt. God used uh, the sin that his brothers meant for evil. God used it for good. And so now, all of a sudden, you've got a very um, exploding population of people in the Israelites who are in Egypt and in slavery in Egypt. Now, they're, they're in slavery, they're, they're in bondage, uh, they're, being, they're being made to work to, to build bricks, essentially, brick and straw, uh, sh- uh, straw-based bricks, rather, for the Egyptians to use. And Pharaoh, um, the Pharaoh of the time, decides to make life harder on them. Uh, he wants to oppress them more, lest they grow up into a population that could overthrow them because that what's what it feels like is happening to this Egyptian powerhouse. And so the the, the Pharaoh does several things. First, he, he says, Hey, I want you to kill at birth all of the baby boys. And at, when the when the midwives refuse to do that, then he said, Here, I'm gonna do something else. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you that we're gonna throw all the baby boys into the Nile River. And Moses was born into that. Moses was, was born a baby boy that should have been thrown in the Nile River as we learn, into the Nile River. And as we learned last, last week, God in his grace and his mercy and his sovereign plan, he raised up Moses in Pharaoh's own household um, to be deliverance, to bring salvation um, to his people. Now, uh, along the way, Moses kind of takes things into his own, own hands, and, and he actually murders somebody. He sees two guys fighting, and he goes, and he stops at it, and in stopping the fight, he kills one of the guys. And so when that happens, he flees to a foreign land. And then, after a time, God calls Moses 
to go back. And he says, listen, Moses, everyone there who wanted you dead, everyone there who knew, your, knew what was going on, they died, but I need you to go back. I've raised you up for this thing, and I'm sending you back. And so um, he gets sent back. So there, there's, the, there's the Israelites in Moses' story. Here, Moses, having been spared, comes back. The, the third people, I think, we, the third group we have to look at is the Egyptians as we're thinking through this. The Egyptians... Um, they were great beneficiaries of the, the oppression and the slavery of the Israelites. You've got to think, their lives were easier because of it. Uh, what we know about uh, Egyptians and Egyptian history, we know they had a lot of false gods. We know that it was a lot of, a lot of uh, false worship of false gods, worship of idols. And so we see that. And then you have Pharaoh. And Pharaoh, um, this would have been, so this was like, you got to think there's major pharaohs. The pharaoh is essentially the king, and after pharaoh dies, another pharaoh is appointed, another king is appointed. Now, this is not the same pharaoh who Moses grew up in his house. He's dead. This is the next man up. This is, this is the next man whom this opposition is uh, against. And so the, the, as the pharaohs uh, kept going, they kept oppressing um, the Israelites. So... If you, if you will, if you've got a, a pew Bible there in front of you, it's going to be on the screens. Follow along with me on, um, I believe it's page 48 in the pew Bible. This is chapter 6 in the book of Exodus. Chapter 6, verse uh, 1. But the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand he will send them out, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of uh, his land. God spoke to Moses and said to him, I'm the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But my name, the Lord, I do not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians hold as slaves. And I have remembered my covenant. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. Moses spoke thus to the people of Israel, but they did not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery. So as we start to, to really pull this passage apart, the first thing I want us to see here is verse 5. And, and here's what verse 5 says, Moreover, I have heard the groaning. Man, the Israelites were known for groaning. Their groaning is not over yet. You'll see all along the way they like to gripe and they like to groan. But here they were truly in anguish, right? So he hears the, the groaning of the people of Israel because they were in slavery. They were in bondage and it was just getting harder. And God says here, I will remember my covenant. Now, I would just say this. Um, as, as human beings, like we, we still can understand what it means to groan. We, we, we have times in our lives that are painful. And we go through circumstances that are hard. Each and every one of us. No one in this room is exempt from it. I look out on faces of people that we've walked through. I've seen you walk through trials. And I've seen you walk through groaning. I've seen you walk through pain and hurt. Here's the first thing I want us just to, to note as we're going into this. As believers, we can fight discouragement because of um, we can fight discouragement. We can defi fight discouragement because of our circumstances. We can fight despair in our suffering. Here's why. We, we must remember and we must believe the promises of God. Because God remembers them and God doesn't forget them. Now, I'm going to show you four promises. That are in this passage for his people. Now first is in verse 6. 6a. And th that is this. It, he said, 6a says. I am the Lord. And he keeps making these statements. I will. I will. Right. So 
Listen for those. I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them. So the first word here, is the first promise is a promise of liberation. God promises to liberate the Israelites. That literally means to save them, to bring them out of slavery. Now, here's what I also know to be true in our lives, is there are things that we are enslaved to. There are things that we would love to quit doing, but we are enslaved to them. Uh, there are things that we're doing that we're, we're, we're enslaved to that we don't know, even know that we're doing them. But God, in his promises of salvation, we can see liberation. The second, in, in 6b, he says this, and I will, there it is again, I will redeem you with an outstretched arms and with great acts of judgment. This is simply redemption. God redeems. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. It's really good that God redeems. God takes Take something that is damaged and broken and hurt and he heals it. God takes something that's not worth anything and he makes it worth something. Actually, he makes it worth a whole lot. God makes beauty from ashes. He does this, and we're going we're gonna to learn about this. He does a redemption. It's redemption through judgment. And it is a harsh, but it is a beautiful thing that God is a redeeming God. One of my, my mentors, um, who is who's a, is a pastor and a preacher in um, South Florida, every Sunday morning, he, he tweets, Redeeming love is my theme and shall be till I die. And here, here is the, really the, 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 the reason that we come to church is, in a lot of ways, in ourselves, redemption. We want the Lord to redeem. And then in verse 7, he says this, here's your, here's your third promise of salvation is I will take you to be my people and I will be your God and you shall know that I'm the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians and here we have the third thing and that is adoption God adopts uh, adoption is a, a beautiful picture of what God does for us he takes um, he takes someone who is not there, he takes someone who, who, who's hardened heart, running from God, and he draws them to him, and he adopts us, and he makes us sons and daughters. Here's the thing about adoption. Most of the time, adoption, as it happens, the adoptee is hostile to the one that is adopting them. I have proof of this in my life. Uh, we, have a, we have several adoptive parents in the room, and they would tell you that this is, this in fact, true. Uh, with the, the very first time that we brought, that, that we like brought home our son from the orphanage, um, he was very hostile towards us. He were like, who are these scary people? I don't want anything to do with them. And he cried, and he cried, and he cried. He cried for days. Um, he cried for 12 hours of a 17-hour plane ride home. He was, uh, he was hostile. But then guess what? He kind of likes us now. And so um, that's the beauty of adoption is that... Um, the, the adopter is the one who is initiating the work. And so he says, I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God. And you shall, shall know that I am the Lord your God who's brought you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. So God adopts, God brings us into his family. And then the, the, the fourth word is simply this, you can see it in verse 8. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. And so that, first, that, that fourth word, a wor word of inheritance, that the, the Lord, he told them long ago, he, he, he told to, to Abraham, this is what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to make you a mighty nation. And in their circumstances, remember if you know much about the Bible in Genesis, the book of Genesis, Abraham had a really, really hard time having children. And it seemed as if there was no way that this was going to happen. But God keeps his promises. God's promises are a yes. They're, they're a guarantee. He's going, he's going to work and move. And here is the inheritance. That he has promised the land. He didn't promise the Israelites slavery. He didn't promise them that, that they would go and, and live under a Pharaoh's rule. No, he promised them their own land. And so he's going to say, look, I'm going to take you and you're going to go and possess that land. You're going to do it. And this is true for us too. 
This is true that in the promises of salvation, there is an inheritance. That's part of, that's part of adoption, right? You know, I've got John Owen sitting here on the, the front row and my, my oldest son. And so before the adoption of our son, if I were to die, um, he would get my full inheritance. You get all my junk. But now you've got somebody to split your junk with because at the point of adoption, right? That's a good thing. I mean, part of it's good. Anyway, <laughs> it's how it works. And so this is, this is inheritance. This means that what, is, what God says is, is that, that we, we have the riches of Christ. This is, this is earthly, but it's also heavenly. This is, this is something that matters now, but this is something that also will matter for all of eternity. So that's the, the first thing I wanted you to see are those four promises. But here's the second thing that I really want, want you to see. And this is a, this is a, really, this is really a major theme. And, and I learned this from Buddy. Buddy. Buddy taught me this. He showed me this, that glory, God's glory in salvation through judgment can be seen in every book of the Bible. And we're going to see it right here. That God's glory in salvation uh, through judgment is, is what we're going to look at. It can be seen in every book of the Bible. Now, it, back in verse 6b, we talked about that already. It says this, And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. So that's the redemption part, but there's a judgment part, right? With great acts of judgment. That God was going to do something. So first I want to show you, as we, we kind of really head into this, there are two, two things really being put on judgment here. And, and first, um, it's the Egyptians' worship of false gods. And so we see this from, from several little scriptures here in Exodus that they, they had a lot of different false gods. And so they, they worshipped a god of fertility. They worshipped a god of of the Nile. They worshipped all these different false gods. Um, this, was, this, was to, this was to show God's power over the false gods. Now it's not a judgment of false gods because they're fake. There's nothing real to judge. This is judgment of the worship of false gods. And so in each one of these acts of judgment, God is showing himself supreme. But then the second thing that's going on here, and that God's glory and salvation through judgment, the second thing that it's judging is Pharaoh. Because here's the deal. Pharaoh thought he was a god. That's what, that's what, it, that's what, it, that's what the, the Bible shows us, that Pharaoh thought so highly of himself that he was a god. Now, this just happens to also to be true of e Egyptian culture, that they, they saw the, the Pharaohs of an incarnation of a deity. And so here, God is going to be showing that, hey, I am greater than Pharaoh. Chapter 7, verse 1, and we're not going to break this apart. This is just narrative. Um, it says this, And the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh. And your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. You shall speak all that I command you. And your brother Aaron shall tell Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go out of his land. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And though I multiply my sons and wonders in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring my host, my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great acts of judgment. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against, the, against Egypt and bring out the people of Israel from among them. Moses and Aaron did so. They did just as the Lord commanded them. And so what's going to happen is that there's these... Ten acts of judgment that are about to happen. And, and here, here Moses, Moses um, had a speech impediment. Moses, Moses wasn't well spoken. God gave him the prophet Aaron who was a much better speaker. But that's just to show that, I mean, at this point, let's, this, is, this is what we know. That God had somebody that had like committed murder and wasn't well spoken that he was about to use to bring him great glory. That God uses uh, everyday humans... To, to do his work. It's not that he was special. And so they go, they go into, uh, go up to Pharaoh, and, and they, they, they just out of obedience do the first thing the Lord does, and they take their staffs, and they take them and they throw them down on the ground. And when they do, they turn into snakes. And so, like, that freaked me out. That freaked you out. Pharaoh goes, hey, magicians, um, practice some sorcery, and 
throw your, throw your staff down and make them go to stakes. And so they do it. And the magicians do it in some sort of evil sorcery. Boom, there goes snakes. And now there's a bunch of snakes on the ground. Anybody like snakes in the room? I knew Dylan did, right? Anybody hate snakes in the room? All right. So then this is what happens. Moses' snake, or it's Aaron's snake one, like, it eats the other snakes, right? And then it turns back into a staff. And so it, this, is, this is nuts, but then what happens, Pharaoh goes, ah, oh, that's, that's nothing. You guys are just magicians, just like my guy. So this is what happened. Um, the Lord, in his sovereign plan, uses these upcoming ten plagues to, to really save Israel. And the first is this, that um, uh, the, the Bible says this, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuses to let the people go. And so then Moses, putting his staff in the, the Nile River, he turns the Nile River to blood. Yet, Pharaoh's heart remained hardened, and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. So then, there's a plague of frogs. I don't like particularly love frogs. Like, I'll catch a frog, I'll play with a frog, tadpoles are cool, but can you imagine, like, feeling something moving in your pillowcase and reaching in there and it being a frog? No, thank you, right? There's a plague of frogs. Well, Pharaoh, like, cries out, Lord, stop the frogs. The frogs are killing me. Please, if you'll remove them, I'll let your people go. Um, but when Pharaoh, he, so this is what the Bible says, but when Pharaoh saw there was a respite, he hardened his heart, and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. So then comes the third plague, and it's gnats. Now, Hebrew here is a little tricky, and so it's either gnats or it's lice or whatever we know. It's like a noceum. It's like something small and really annoying. That's what this is. Um, same thing, the magician's like... He calls his magicians, and the magicians tried to like mimic it, and, and either they couldn't mimic it or couldn't make it go away. And so then the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. This is the magicians giving up. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not let them go as the Lord had said. Then, I guess God just increased it here, and he made it flies. Um, I was... I was in this situation one time where I was stuck in a, in a, in a hunting blind by a water hole over in Lyman, Colorado. And I'm, I'm in that hunting blind and a herd of cattle come in. And there's actually like a cowboy driving the cattle in and it was kind of like this cool scene coming over the, the hill and I thought, this is cool. And they, they come in and the cows drink at this water hole and they leave. And you know what they left me? A whole bunch of flies. And I really felt like, man, this would be like really good torture to somebody because I'm sitting there trying to be still and it's like, drove me nuts. Can you imagine whole swarms? Can you imagine everything, every piece of food that you, you went to, to eat and having fly and fly larva on it? No, it would be horrible. And so here again, um, Pharaoh asked Moses this time, he says, hey, will you get rid of these? Ask Moses to God, he, Pharaoh asked Moses to ask God to get rid of them and take them away. And then he said, I'll let your people go. Um, but Pharaoh hardened his heart this time also, and he did not let the people go. Now, I, I want to point out two things here. Uh, I want to pause in, in, in this list of things and point out a couple things. Well, one, up until this point, it said... Basically, in the beginning, God had hardened Pharaoh's heart. It has a pronouncement that his heart was hard. And then it would say that Pharaoh hardened his heart. Well, each time Pharaoh gives a response, as we actually see it in the text, uh, one, there's conditional obedience there. Pharaoh says, I'll let your people go, but I'm going to put this condition on it. He would say that. So, like, I'll let you go, I'll let your men go, but your wives and your children have to stay here. Or, I'll let, your, I'll let you go, and I'll let your wives and your children go, but your livestock have to stay here. And, of course, they were like, we want to go up into the wilderness in, in order to make sacrifices and to worship. We like, have to have our wives, livestock. So each time, he would make this conditional obedience, but it wasn't true obedience. 
The second thing is fake repentance. That's what, that's what he had, was fake repentance. Um, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Just make this thing go away, and, and um, I'll get it right. I'll, I'll let them go. Just make it go away. Can I, can I tell you that, that I feel like these two things, conditional obedience um, and fake repentance, are a huge part of my life, um, a huge part of my story? That, that I would say, okay, Lord, I'll do this when I get older, right? I'll submit my life and I'll live for you when I get older. Oh, I'll start doing this when I blank, right? So uh, my life is filled with conditional obedience. Lord, I'll go there if you do X. I'll, I'll obey this command if you blank, right? It's just, it's full of it. And I have a feeling that there's a lot of people in the room who, who share that with me, that there's a lot of conditional obedience in your life you know i see this with my pastor friends all the time they'll they'll say i'll serve the lord i'll do anything he wants but then he'll give them gps coordinates just let me be six six hours from mama you know whatever and 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 i don't think that's what we see in the bible i think we see obedience in the bible there's no condition to it and then the second thing is like fake repentance man this is my life i would come to a trial or something hard, or something uncomfortable, I'd get myself in a mess, and I can remember over and over praying, Lord, just let me get out of this thing. Lord, just fix this thing. Lord, I've, I have made a mess, and I've made a market, just fix it. I can remember it with girlfriends. I can remember it when my dad died. I, I can remember it in, my, in like incredibly wild and rebellious years. I can remember it being intoxicated, laying on a bed with one foot on the ground, and the world spinning, feeling like I was going to die. Saying, oh Lord, just get me out of this and I'll never do this again. Like, it's fake repentance. That's what he, he was doing. Uh, he didn't mean it. And so, I think the Lord, in his sovereign goodness, allows us to continue to go through those trials until we stop the fake repentance. So then, uh, the, the next plague that he brings to them is livestock. Uh, he goes and he kills all their livestock. Except in Goshen, which is the area where the Israelites were. And so it was very, very clear, like the magicians actually, he sent the magicians out to go over to Goshen and to, to check it out and say, hey, what's going on? How is this, how is this possible? Um, rather than sending the Israelites out, he sent them. And, th- and this is what happened. And Pharaoh sent, and behold, none of the livestock of Israel was dead, but the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people go. And then God gave them giant boils all over their bodies, Um, The magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boils came upon the magicians and upon all the Egyptians. But the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he did not listen to them as the Lord had spoken to Moses. Then there was a great hell storm, and it came and it attacked essentially their their crops. And and, and here's this great hell falling, and it's destroying everything. And and Pharaoh saw saw it. Uh, that the rain and the hail and the thunder had ceased after he asked Moses to stop it. And he sinned yet again and hardened his heart, he and his servants. So the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people of Israel go, just as the Lord had spoken through Moses. Then he brought on locusts, great swarms of locusts. Now, I don't don't know if you've ever seen uh, like a YouTube video of a swarm of of locusts, um, but it is insane. And I can't imagine the great swarm of Elosa. So now you've got all this stuff, all these crops on the ground, and they can't go and they can't salvage it because he sends locusts to eat it. And so again, he cries out and he asks Moses to ask God to stop it, and he does. And it says this, not a single locust was left in all the country of Egypt. A great wind came in and blew them away. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the people of Israel go. And then the ninth one, darkness, but... But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and would not let them go. Then Pharaoh said to him, get away from me. Take care to never see my face again, for on the day you see my face you shall die. Moses, I'm tired of you. You keep messing with me, I'm going to kill you. That's what you need to know. You come back up in here with another plague and you're dead. Moses kind of laughs because he believes God and he says, as you say, you'll not see my face again. And so here's what I want to say. We're going to stop right there. There's a tenth plague. We're going to talk about the 10th plague next week as we talk about what's really called the Exodus. But what I want to show you this is, is God's 
glory and salvation through judgment is that God is using the hardening of the heart of a king in order to save. Now, Proverbs 21.1 says this, and I believe this is true. The king's heart is a stream of water in my hand, says the Lord. I will turn it wherever I will. And so here, here's, what, here's what we can know is that, that every ruler that has ever lived in the world, I'm talking, um, I'm talking Donald Trump, I'm talking Barack Obama, I'm talking Kim Jong-un, I'm talking um, Vladimir Putin, right? I, I'm talking um, all your kings, all your queens, I'm telling you that their heart is in the hands of God, every oppressor, every good king. Now, this is kind of hard, hard to fathom. This is hard to say. Okay, the king's heart is a stream of water in my hands. The Lord will turn it wherever he wills. This was also true for Julius Caesar, who put Jesus to death, right? This is also true for Nero, who was responsible for Peter and Paul and James and who knows how many other guys' death, right? This is true. That in, in the, the, the cosmic fear of what God, sphere of what God is doing, God is sovereign and God is in control. In every evil ruler, in every good ruler, on the, the very cosmic level, God is using them for his glory. Now, do you think that that the, uh, the Egyptians in that moment could have, I mean, I'm sorry, the Israelites in Egypt in that moment could have looked to Pharaoh and saw any way that, that God was going to use him for their glory. Well, no, of course they couldn't. They were being oppressed in that moment. Of course they couldn't. But in, in God's plan and in the scheme of time, God even said it, Pharaoh, I'm raising you up for my glory. You call yourself God, but you're going to know I'm God. This is God's God's glory in salvation through judgment. Our God is sovereign. Each time there, he hardened Pharaoh's heart. He's doing it for his glory. It's hard for us to see with human eyes on a human level. But this is what I think. Imagine if at the very first plague that God, that, that um, Pharaoh would have just said, Okay, you guys can go. Do you know who would have gotten the glory? Moses. Moses would have gotten the glory. But after time, after time, after time, Moses didn't get the glory. You know what the Israelites thought? Moses, you're a failure. They heard those four promises of I will and salvation. And it said, it said there in 6, it said like they didn't believe them because of the sorrow in their heart. And so what I, what I want you to see and what I want you to understand is that God, in his goodness, in his mercy, he had to have those ten plagues, and we'll see it next week in completion, that he had to use it to fulfill his will so that he could get the glory and not man. God uses um, his... his uses his ability to form the man's heart. Here, here's the truth. When you think about a man's heart, and what we talk about, um, uh, what, what's a hard heart and what's a soft heart. When we talk about, this is, this is somewhat of a religious speak, so this is not something like, you're not going to hear this just around town. They've got a hard heart, they've got a soft heart. This is, this is something we, we talk about uh, in church. And here's what we believe, is that our hearts are hard from birth, that we don't have to, God doesn't have to reach down and harden our hearts, that that we are sinners and that we're, we're, we're born with a sinful nature. And that as we, we grow, our hearts grow hard as we grow. This is what we believe, that, that our hearts are hard. So this isn't, this isn't, from the very beginning, Pharaoh's heart is hard here. But God continues to steer and to shape his heart. Really here what's happening is God is keeping his heart hard. Now... Here's the next thing I want you to see, and this is, the, this is the really good news, is that God is sovereign in salvation. This is a lot of what we read in Romans chapter 8 this morning, that God is the one doing the work in salvation. You see, the Israelites could not have saved themselves. They could not have brought themselves out of 
um, slavery from the Egyptians. They couldn't have just decided one day, hey, I'm throwing off these shackles, I'm throwing off these chains, and we, as a nation, we're leaving. We're done. Couldn't have done it. Egypt was a powerhouse. The Egyptians wouldn't have let them go. They truly needed God to save. And so God is the one who puts that into motion. I just want to point out that the, that the Israelites, at not just this point in the journey, but even in the journey ahead, many, many times, many times in many places in Scripture, they would just rather go back to Egypt. They would rather go back to bondage. They would rather go back to slavery. There's probably many, many Egyptians, when Moses came and said, hey, we're, we're busting out of here. We're going we're to tell Moses to let us go, that they would say, oh, but we're fine here. Not understanding the depth of the oppression that they were in. And so, in this story, what we see is that God is also sovereign in salvation with us. And that just as God was working in Pharaoh's heart, it is God who would be the one who would work in our heart. And we looked at those I wills of salvation. And here's the truth. Jesus has his own set of I wills. And his I wills say that Jesus says, I will save you. I will deliver you. I will redeem you. I will make you my own. These are the I wills of Jesus that we can see in Scripture. We can find liberation in Jesus. It is because that God first loved us and he pursues us, that, he, that he, he is the one who can take the chains off. He's the one that can free us from our natural slavery to sin and to self. He's a, he's a liberating God. He's a, he's a redeeming God. God can take someone who has a very, very hard heart, very far away from, from Jesus or the things of, things of the Lord in any certain way, and he can just make those things. He, he can redeem them. He can raise beauty from ashes. This is easy for some of us to see because we've, we remember being ashes. We remember what the Lord, we remember where we were when the Lord called us to him. It's easy to look back on when, you, when, you've, when you've been redeemed. This is also true that we see adoption. We can be a, adopted as sons and daughter. We see this taught in the New Testament. That God, um, that God saves his children. He adopts them and he calls them sons and daughters. He calls them co-heirs with Christ. And then we can see our inheritance. That God gives us a, a spiritual inheritance. We see we see this in the New Testament, that, that here, this same thing, the same thing he's doing for them, he gives to us. He gives us a spiritual inheritance, not only here, but in eternity in heaven. But I want to show you the major difference here. You see, Pharaoh, who had done many, 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 many evil things. Pharaoh, who deserved every bit of the judgment that he received. He had done those things before the plague started, right? What Pharaoh needed was mercy. God showed him judgment. Pharaoh took the judgment. Pharaoh deserved the judgment. Well, but here's, here's the difference. And the difference is that Jesus took our judgment. You see, this is what the Bible says. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, right, the wages of sin of death, but the gift of God is salvation in Christ Jesus our Lord. This, this, is, this is the difference, is that the punishment that we deserved, the punishment that should have been placed on us, the Bible says that Jesus took that on on the cross. That when Jesus died on the cross, he died for our sins. He took our judgment. He took our punishment. And God, being who he is in sovereign in salvation, knowing that he was sending his son to the earth to die on the cross to save humanity. But that, that salvation comes with yet what? Like it's, it's not just an open statement, it's to who? Right? It's to his chosen people. It's those who he predestined. It's those who he called. And this is what it says. The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised his son from the dead, then you will be saved. Salvation comes by grace, God's unmerited favor. It comes 
through faith, through believing that Jesus is the one who died for us, who paid our price. Now, for, often for us, as we, we look at this, we kind, of, we kind of look at it and we look at the God of the hardening of, of hearts. And we, we kind of think, man, this is just, this is big stuff and, and hard to comprehend. It's hard to think that God has the, the, the heart of the king in his, in his hands and he forms it where he will to, to accomplish his will, to bring himself glory. But I want to show you today that the miracle, the miracle isn't that, that Pharaoh's heart was hardened. That's not the miracle. It's not that, it's not, the miracle isn't that God has the power to harden a heart. The miracle is that God would ever soften a heart in the first place. And so here's what I want to tell you. I want you to think about your life right now. I want to think about, why, think about why you're in this room. Think about every point on the timeline of your life and, and every hardship and every mountaintop high and every time you ended up in the valley. Think about every time that someone has come along and given you a word of Jesus, given you a word of encouragement, that in God's sovereign plan and in His, His way that He has put people in your life and circumstances in your life that are molding you into this moment. And in this moment, I've got to believe there are people in the room who have never placed their faith and their trust in Jesus, and they've had a hard heart, harder than Pharaoh's. And yet today, God is saying, believe in the Lord Jesus. He's softening that heart. He's given the ability to love because yet he first loved us. And so this is the good news. This is the good news we call the gospel. Now, today, if, if you think, man, I think God's got me here today for a reason. I think that the Lord had me hear this story today for a reason. Maybe today he's saving you. Maybe today is the day that you place your faith and your trust in the Lord. Maybe it's today that, that you would believe in the Lord Jesus, that you would believe that he died on the cross for your sins and that he saved you. We're going we're gonna to respond in, an, in another song of, of worship. Josh and the guys, you guys come back up and, and lead us. And this is why we sing. This is why we're the singing faith. The, the Bible tells us that we sing songs and hymns and spiritual songs, and we do so out of adoration out of our hearts towards God. But today, as, as we're singing, here's, how, here's, here's a way for you to respond if you've believed the gospel today. Just cry out to God in prayer during this song and say, God, I'm placing my trust in you. I'm placing my trust that you, you are freeing me today. And God, I'm asking that you would save me. And if you do that today, man, I would love for you to come and to talk to me after the service. You can actually take that card, and on the back of that card, you can check a box that says salvation. And, and, and I would love to come and explain that farther. Maybe, maybe in the past few weeks, and I feel like this is probably true, in the past few weeks that God has, has moved in the hearts of some people, he's softened the hearts of people, and, and that, that your heart has been softened. And God has changed your heart, and you need to be baptized now. And we'll, we'd love to, to you, you check that box, and I'd love to talk to you what, about what it means to be baptized and what it means to follow Jesus in baptism. So now, everybody stand as we sing a song of response. Father, I want to pray to you and ask that you would um, not us, let us not be hearers of your word, but doers also. That you would work in our hearts this morning. That you would... Um, Soften our hearts towards you, that you would tune our ears to be able to hear your voice. And God, that you would move and work in us and, and through us. And so, Lord, we love you and we praise you. Amen.